G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a quick presentation that I've actually had asked by users quite a lot, which is focused around whether you should be learning about building add-ins or learning Dynamo, and ultimately whether your goal should be to build add-ins or just build Dynamo scripts. So Dynamo versus add-ins is sort of what I'm calling this presentation. So we'll get started, um, but it's sort of just a, a critique or a discussion of what add-ins should be, and I guess things you should keep in mind if your goal is to become a developer. So I mainly made this video because I'm always getting asked, should I learn Dynamo? Or should I just move straight on to learning C Sharp and add-ins? As well as that, is Dynamo ruining the market? And is there a place for the add-in market anymore? And finally, can I make money building and selling plugins? So plugins, well, what are they? Or add-ins, uh, whatever you call them, um, apps. Uh, typically, they're produced in C Sharp language and in a program called Visual Studio using Revit API or Action Programming Interface. So commands that let us automate or streamline processes in Revit. For example, the creation of a wall or tagging all the, all the rooms in all views at the same time. Um, so the results are typically compiled into a program. So your work is protected if you build an add-in. It's hard for someone to go and access your source code. I think it might even be impossible. Um, so it's very hard to reproduce your efforts if you build them as an add-in. So as a result, you can sell them or control them. It's important to keep in mind that these days, um, major companies typically actually hire their own in-house programmers or specialists that build their own in-house apps instead of going on the market. Now, some apps are very useful and some big companies do still use them. But typically, because of the sheer amount of people that they employ and the amount of machines they have to deploy a plug-in to, it's often more profitable for them to control the add-in and make it free in-house as a result. But as a result, they also own the IP or the intellectual property and the workflow itself, so it becomes part of their competitive edge. So if you do go into, add, into the add-in market, don't expect that big companies will be your biggest client. You may actually be targeting the smaller companies that don't build their own tools. So essentially, as well as this, don't go into the add-in market expecting to just make money as your goal, because you may not. I get a lot of developers coming to me very desperate for marketing because they're not making money out of their pursuit. They went into it for the wrong reason. You shouldn't go in expecting money to be the main thing you get out of this. Two things that really are important to get out of developing add-ins is firstly, raising your marketing profile for a business service. This is a very common approach. So the add-in isn't what generates them the money. The exposure that it raises directs them to their website or to their business service. A good example of this is a company called DI Roots that makes free tools, but by developing these free tools, it's sort of like a digital resume for what they can do with a customized service for their clients. Uh, so the market itself is the Autodesk App Store. Um, this is where most tools can be found. Some developers don't put their tools on the App Store, they put them on their own website, where they can be purchased or downloaded if they're free. But a lot of the tools do belong in the App Store. So if we just look at the numbers on the App Store, um, there's currently about 1,600 apps, unique apps from what I can see. This doesn't mean that they, they do the same thing. Some of them are unique, some do the same thing as other apps. As well as this, out of these, about a third of them are currently free. So if you are on the App Store, keep in mind that a third of the market is already free. So if you charge for your app, you do need to look at your competition and see how you can compare to them. So out of this, about another third of that market is paid in some form. Now this isn't subscription, this is outright payment. And I believe on top of that, there's a subscription component of the market as well. Um, and about maybe two thirds of this market is built for Revit 2020 plus. So that means a third of the market isn't compatible in the latest build of Revit. So there is a degree of obsolescence present on the market at the moment. So you do need to support your product if you're a developer. Otherwise your product will fall by the wayside and not make you money anymore. This brings with it some problems that I see in the add-in store and just add-ins in general as something to use, which is sort of why I rely on Dynamo a lot more than I rely on add-ins these days. The first thing is redundancy. There are so many add-ins on the store that do the same thing as other add-ins, and it's very hard to tell which one is best. As a result, the best add-ins are typically the ones that have strong marketing, where people know that the add-in is good at what it does. So if you make a little tool or add-in and put it on the app store, make sure that you market it properly. 
Otherwise, people probably won't buy it because they'll just see a whole set of apps and yours will just be another one that looks like the rest of them. So you need to make sure that it's something that's also hard to reproduce. Don't make it something really simple. So if it's just like a few lines of code, it's probably not worth turning into an add-in because someone else can just make it as well. As well as this, um, like I said, support is sometimes a problem for add-ins. Sometimes add-ins just aren't raised up to the next version of Revit. So you may be using an add-in and very reliant on an add-in um, for quite a while. And maybe you get to say Revit 2021 and suddenly you don't have that add-in available. Well, that can be a big problem if you're very dependent on that in your workflows because the developer doesn't have to make the new version if they don't want to. So do keep that in mind. Whereas if you're using Dynamo, you might be able to upgrade your scripts quite quickly for a new build. So it's good to have that sort of lack of dependency on the market. As well as that, um, I do see a lot of products with very bad ratings and they stay on the market. So you do have to be very careful that what you buy works as well because they're not always well tested. Sometimes people rush their tools onto the market and they get through the moderation. So you do have to be very careful about what you actually buy. There's also what I like to call the Netflix phenomenon, where if you subscribe to all these apps together, you might forget how much you're actually paying um, for these apps when it all, it all adds up. It's a bit of a trap with subscriptions these days because we sort of don't think about the overall amount of money we're paying total. It's an effective marketing strategy. It's a good way to get money out of people's pockets. Um, whereas if you buy something outright, you really do consider how much you just paid for it. Whereas if it's maybe $3 a month, wow, that's not much. But what if I buy 10 apps that cost that? Well, that's $30 a month. I probably wouldn't have bought an app for $30 a month, but I'll buy 10. So it, it sort of tricks you into you know, spending more money than you intended. So do be really careful if you are gonna get lots of different little apps. Um, as well as this scaling and deployment is always a challenge with add-ins versus Dynamo. Now Dynamo's got its own challenges for deployment before everyone gets their pitchforks out. I know that that's a problem too. Um, but I, in my opinion, controlling deployment with Dynamo is easier to control in-house than having to purchase multiple copies of add-ins that don't have multi-user licenses or just even keeping versioning up to date. And if, if there's an error in an add-in and you've just rolled it out to 300 machines, it's a lot harder to update that add-in um, compared to fixing a script in Dynamo. So there are some challenges that come with this. And obviously if you've got a very expensive add-in such as this one here, um, it can be quite expensive to deploy this to a lot of machines. So I do find sometimes with add-ins, there's this problem that a few supercomputers in the office might have all the add-ins on them. And as a result, you only get a few users that actually get to benefit from these add-ins. So in my opinion, plugin, plugins need to be a few things in order to be successful. And you need to keep this in mind when you develop. So I think that they, they need to be useful and unique. So I've put some, some suites or tools down, down below that are add-ins that I've used before in the past that stand out because they're unique or their offering is very useful. Um, as well as this, they're very easy to use and they're very reliable. So I think you at least, at least need to fulfill one of these two criteria in order to be successful. Your tool has to be very good at what it does and very unique at what it does, or it needs to be just that easy to use that it, it saves you time and money. As well as this, I think that the best plugins tend to be packaged. They tend to contain a few tools in one so that you sort of combat the Netflix subscription phenomenon by purchasing suites rather than purchasing, say, 10 different tools, all made by separate developers. So there's some good examples down here. Some of the same tools I showed before actually belong to suites as well. Um, like the CTC BIM management suite, for example, is still very popular. And I think it's around about $2,000 a year, so it's not cheap, but what it offers is a big suite of tools. Now keep in mind, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies. I'm just talking about um, add-ins in general. Um, so yeah, there's no sponsorship with these companies I've chosen. <laughs> as well as this, plugins do need to be affordable um, in most cases because you might get priced out of the market. There are companies such as DI Roots that are producing a lot of free, very robust tools um, that do what a lot of paid apps do as well. And I've noticed that over time, there is a tendency for companies to shift to free apps as well. Even if they're not quite as reliable as some of the, the longer lasting tools, if they can do what they say they do, um, they're still gonna get, they're still gonna price other tools out of the market. Now, I don't think this is this, this company's intent, by the way. Um, I don't think DI, DI Roots is trying to get rid of companies by doing this. It's just a natural phenomenon. I think it's great that they're supporting free tools to support the industry. And I hope to review some of them on the channel at a later date. I also think plugins, they need to be hard to reproduce in Dynamo. If you've got a tool such as say this one here, 
And I'm sorry to the developer that I picked their tool specifically, but it was a good example of a tool that is easy to make in Dynamo if you know how. Um, this tool, for example, it just opens the address or the folder that the active project is in. Now, this is only a few lines of scripting. Um, I can do this in Python in about probably 10 lines maybe, including all the modules that support this function. So you do need to be really careful that your add-in isn't that hard to make because otherwise no one's really gonna use it unless they don't know any better. And people are getting better in Dynamo and Python every day. So your app will lose relevance very quickly if Dynamo can do it instead. So just as a bit of a comparison, I've just put some basic comparison points between Dynamo and add-ins. Um, this is mainly just so you can have a look at it and understand better what my opinions are. Now there are two things here that add-ins do better than Dynamo that I've listed here. So I'm not just saying that add-ins are terrible and you shouldn't use them, that they are actually better in some cases. Um, the two main things that I see add-ins as good for is their speed. Typically they're much more direct in how they talk to Revit. So they're a lot faster. So that is one really good benefit of using add-ins. They will save you some time if your goal is just to work as fast and efficiently as possible. On top of that, I guess you can make a profit from selling them still. So they are a business avenue. I don't think that Dynamo is a viable profit avenue for a business if you're just selling scripts because you can't really protect a script, unfortunately. You can sell the service of building scripts for people, but to sell a script as an object, it's pretty hard. It's the service that you need to sell, not the script itself. Whereas an add-in, you can, you can compile it, you can protect it. It's quite different in how it's packaged. But you can see that I've said here that Dynamo is both open source and free. So these are two really big benefits to using Dynamo. As well as that, it's fairly easy to learn. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, I'll probably be producing a course at a later date um, to help people get started with Dynamo as well. Um, and I guess on top of that, it's tied to Revit. So as long as you have Revit, you have Dynamo. So it's not too hard to deploy and set up. Um, especially in later builds of Revit where it's tied to Revit itself. So like I said, I, I do often get asked, um, should I learn Dynamo or just learn C Sharp and add-ins? Um, you know, will it ruin the market and can I make money from selling plugins? And in this case, I usually respond with these two things. Um, firstly, that you need to learn, you need to learn Dynamo to learn programming if you're a non-programmer in, in, in Revit. Dynamo will introduce you to the fundamental concepts that you'll need to build on in order to develop add-ins later on. It's very hard to begin with C-sharp. Um, it's possible, but it's very hard. On top of that, Dynamo has and will continue to disrupt the programming market because now programming is a mainstream ability for most people. Many non-programmers can now program. So don't expect to build very simple add-ins anymore that will get lots of money for you. It won't happen because Dynamo can just be can just be used by anyone that you know spends a few weeks learning it. So don't expect that to be the case anymore. So it, it will disrupt the market, and, and it should. And I guess, like I said, the following conditions of add-ins I think will trump um, the, these aspects. So it's that it needs to be useful and unique, easy to use and reliable, affordable, ideally packaged, and hard to emulate in Dynamo. So if your add-in does meet these criteria, then I think it has the capability to be successful. And remember that you do need to market it well as well. So this presentation will be on GitHub. Um, I hope you enjoyed my critique and my opinion. Um, of course, it's just my opinion, but I, I look forward to hearing what other people think about um, the two programs. Um, I'm sure that at least a few of you will say Dynamo is slow and inefficient, so ultimately it's not gonna be a good solution. And, and to some degree, I probably do agree, depending on the scale that you deploy at. Um, but I'll be interested to hear sort of your take on whether maybe Dynamo has disrupted the plugin market quite a lot, um, and if it has hurt the bottom line of some developers that relied on this as their income source before. Um, but ultimately, it's up to you which one you pick. Um, if your goal is to become an add-in developer, go for it. Don't let me stop you. Um, if this is your goal and this is your motivation, good. Um, I'm sure you'll find success, success in it. If you're going in unsure, start with Dynamo and just try it out. That's usually my advice. Um, don't go right into the deep end because you might drown, like, you know, like try to try to go in with baby steps and Dynamo is a great way to do that. And you might find that Dynamo does enough for you. So I hope you've enjoyed um, this presentation. Uh, I make videos two times a week and aim to do so for a while. Um, if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And uh, I look forward to seeing most of you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.